you want to read about the birth of Jesus Christ and the story behind it, you have to read Luke 1 and 2 or Matthew 1 and 2. But John tells us what he does take is from the birth of Jesus Christ to the cross. And John's gospel is a gospel of great theology uh, for the church. In the first chapter in 14, John approaches the subject and he discussed the birth of Christ in a completely different way than we might think it would normally be approached. I doubt very seriously we would hear today a Christmas story like I'm about to bring you because most of the time it's the nativity scene. This is not what John tells you about. John says that the word became flesh. The word, notice that's a, that is a capital W. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word, God's word, became flesh. That's the part of the Christmas story that we're probably not familiar with. We normally are interested in a baby born, placed in a manger, the temple shepherds come down. But here is one. So here's what I want to ask you to do. At the very top of your paper, I want you to draw a line across the top, a pretty good distance, pretty good distance. Draw a straight line across the top of your paper. Don't make it a little dinky line. <laughs> draw a pretty good line up there. Estimate the middle of that line. Put a dot, and then around that dot, put a square box. Because here's what John has in mind. Here's what John has in mind. That line is eternal. That line is eternal. On the left side of that box and that line is past, eternity past. On the right side of that line, on the other side of that box, is eternity future. Eternity future. That box represents eternity now, and that's human history. That box is human history. That dot in the middle of that box, in the middle of that line, draw a line down from it through the box and write the word incarnation. Because that dot represents to John the incarnate word of God. It, comes, it came from eternity past, stepped into human history in eternity present, and will be part of eternity future. That's John's message to you today. The Word became flesh. The Word of God that came out of eternity past. We call that conference back there, Eternal Life Conference, when God set the whole program out and said that the second member of the Godhead would, resent, would be the central piece of the plan of God and then he put human history into that equation. And John writes about that occasion. He says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And his name was Jesus the Christ. How important is that to human history? It's essential. It is the central piece, the centerpiece of human history is the birth of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh. The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And John says, we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. That's who our Savior is. This is all about that, that dot in the middle of that box 
is what we call Christmas. I want to show you something else. See that dot in the middle of that box on that line called eternity? If you look to the left of that box, that's the first advent. If you look to the right of that dot inside that box, that's second advent. See, there's two parts to the incarnation of Christ that's very important. The first advent and the second advent. Now, here's what you probably don't understand that John's trying to teach you, at least this Christmas through me. That the barrier of time and space, the barrier of time and space was broken by the incarnate birth of Jesus Christ. Can you wrap your head around that, Bennett? Human history. The whole creation started, started inside that box. The whole creation story. The whole time and space issue of human history was all about the coming of Christ. The word becoming flesh and dwelling among us in time and space. There never was anything like this ever before. This, this Christmas is quite an event. When you look at it from the incarnation of theology. After a word of prayer, we're going to come back and we're going to take a look at this. I've got three points I want to make about this idea. The theology of the birth of Christ, according to John. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us, for the visitors visiting with their families in for the holidays and come to church. They will hear a Christmas story today like none other. The theology behind the incarnate or the birth story of Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing the incarnation is when you look at it from a divine perspective and by divine design. And when you hear a word like hypostatic union, it makes sense when you look at the theology of eternity connected with the Son of God. Or as John said, the only begotten of the Father. What an enormous event in human history. I pray today, Father, we could give it justice to what an enormous event this was for human history. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Gary Horton, I had a pile of mail stacked up when I got back from the hospital with my wife. I picked out his before I looked at all the bills I had to pay. I put, pulled Gary's out because I always love to read you ought to get on Gary's, he, his supporter group. If you don't get his prayer letter, you should get it. But I was thrilled to read at the top of it because of my message today. Goes in line with that, what he wrote. I had no idea it was there when I was putting this lesson together. But boy, this unknown author hit it when he said Christmas is that moment in time when God incarnate stepped out of heaven into earth so that we who believe in him will one day step out of this earth into heaven for all eternity. That's what my lesson is about, and that's what John was writing about. Paul reminds us in 2 Peter, or Peter reminds us in 2 Peter 3, uh, 16, that when you study Paul or some writings like John, you're going to have to have your thinking cap on. I encourage you to do that today. 
You do that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Have I had prayer with you? I talked about having it. I didn't have that personal prayer. Did I have it? All right, well, then I'm ready to go. I felt like I needed to pray again. Maybe it was for me. <laughs> Maybe it was for me. Well, anyhow, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. First, this is John 1.14. We saw his glory. Isn't that interesting? We saw because in that box at the top of your paper with that dot in there, that is the incarnation. And you actually, what was prophetic and what came out of eternity past, because Christ stepped out of eternity into time, space, and matter. Now, think about that. Now, we, when we think about eternity, stepping out of time and into the presence of, of God or Christ, we don't think about that until we say things, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more this, no more that. We don't realize that what we're really talking about is space, time, and matter. But Christ provided all of that by the principle of grace. And that's a, a powerful idea, a powerful idea. John's personal testimony, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God, John 134, personal testimony. When it says the word became flesh, it's ho lagos. The word ho is not ho ho like Christmas. It's a definite article. Ho. Logos. Logos is a really interesting way to identify it. We talk about the holy word of God. We talk about a holy God. We talk about a holy Christ. We talk about uh, holy, 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 which is the idea of sanctified. But here it is, the whole lagos. And what he's talking about, it always existed. The word that became flesh always existed. There was never a time when it didn't exist as whole lagos, but it existed in God. It's only when God speaks it out that it becomes something that we can touch, handle, and, and discuss. When he speaks it out. Creation was there long before it came into existence because it was in the mind of God. When he spoke it, it becomes something that we could touch, feel, and handle. And even Paul said in Romans 1, 18 and on, he said that it is a way to connect with God as an unbeliever, the creation story. It, it, it didn't become creation until he spoke it into human history. And it's true with the word. The word, the word became flesh. It always existed as the word. But once it became part, once it got inside that box of human history, it is something now that we could see. We saw his glory. As the only, what was the glory? The only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth. John said, I witnessed it personally because of my relationship with Christ. It's a powerful idea, and I hope you will spend some time thinking about it. For example, when in John 1, 1 through 4, when he opens his book, he talks about in the beginning. It, there's no definite article there. He didn't say in the beginning. He said in a beginning. And there's a world of difference in that. The beginning puts your finger on a mark. A beginning says there are many beginnings. In fact, that's the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, the word Genesis means many beginnings. If you study the book of Genesis, you will see many beginnings. You will see the, uh, the, uh, the unfolding of the plan of God into human history out of the book of Genesis. It is a book of many beginnings in the plan of God. Your life has a beginning. The moment you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, your life has a beginning. And along that course, it will have many other beginnings. As you begin to apply your life to the plan of God, there will be, be other beginnings. 
When you discover you have a spiritual gift, there will be a beginning. When you have spiritual growth maturity to pay attention to what God is saying to your heart through the Holy Spirit, you will have beginnings. You will begin, you will begin to have an effective prayer life. When he opens the book of John, when you read John 1 through 4, it doesn't say the beginning. It says the same thing that Genesis 1-1 says, in a beginning. You see, the beginning in your life, whether it's salvation or spiritual or family or marriage or whatever it is, these are beginnings because you have a beginning in God, in Christ. Your beginning is... In the plan of God, the word become flesh and dwells in you. And with that come beginnings. And listen, those beginnings will run all the way through time in your life and into eternity. Beginnings. When you die from this time and space and matter, you will go to be present with the Lord in what's called eternity future. And there'll be, and that is a beginning, another beginning. Not unlike any of the others, just another beginning. And there'll be more of those. Because all of your beginnings that, that matter in human history and beyond it are all associated with God in Christ. All of them. If there's anything you need to walk away from this holiday season, from at least my lesson, is to know that. We focus so much on one a beginning that we lose sight of all the other ones. God wants you to embrace all the beginnings that have flowed to your life and flow to your life and will continue to flow both in time and eternity because it's greater than time, matter, and space. I hope you understand that. I'll tell you something else. You don't see in the English. But in John, when he opens his book in John 1, 1 through 4, all of the, all of the, everything he says in those verses verbally are in the imperative mood, are, are in the imperfect mood. It is the word was. Was. The word was. In John 1, 1 through 4, the word was every time is an imp imperfect in indicative. The imperfect tense means that something something that was completed in the past, something that occurred, some event in the past is still flowing. That event in the past is still flowing with the same force that it began. For example, an imperfect tense would be that I entered into the gospel message that had already been in existence for 2,000 years. And when I believed the gospel of Jesus Christ in Tarrant City under old John Haggai's preaching, I became part of something that had already been established and would now carry me on further through it. I had a beginning. I had a birth in Christ, a, a new beginning, a beginning a part of something of the past that is now carrying me forward to the future. All of these, all of them, are, are all established by that. Also, aimi, the word was, which in the Greek is aimi, listen to me now, listen to me, that's an absolute status quo verb of existence. For example, when God wanted to identify who he was, he said, I am that I am. When Jesus, in John the 8th chapter, verse 58, when Jesus told them that he too was I am, they picked up stones and tried to kill him. Because they understood that he had identified himself with the eternal existence of God himself. I am that I am. I have always existed. I've just stepped into time to bring you a message from God. That's what he's saying. What an interesting concept of continued existence in past with a time point 
that now arbitrarily we call the incarnation. In John 14, he says, the word became flesh in John 1.14. What an interesting concept that the whole Lagos all existed, will always exist, but you have an opportunity and time to participate with it. The word became flesh, and it became flesh for you and me, that we could participate in his glory as the only begotten from the Father. You have no idea. I know it, don't. I can look in your eyes. You have no idea the, the enormous message I'm bringing to you for your life. Somewhere you've got to pull this lesson back. Somewhere you've got to pull this lesson back and study it because you're missing the impact. The Holy Spirit will teach you what I'm telling you. It is life-changing to understand what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is life-changing. I want to tell you first, John's theological approach to the birth of Jesus Christ was more than the birth of a Messianic Savior. Pay attention. More than the birth of the only begotten Son of God. John's theological message was that the birth of Jesus Christ was the eternal Word of God becoming flesh, stepping out of eternity into time, space, and matter that we could behold his glory as the only sensibly understand it as the only begotten son of the father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the father. The father and I are one. This is the teaching of John in the 10th chapter. It's a powerful idea that the incarnation of Jesus Christ broke time, space, and matter. It is a phenomenal idea to the human psyche. And in this, he separated the understanding of the first and second coming. It's a marvelous idea. It is so far beyond what we normally think about the birth of Jesus Christ. The incarnation is a most powerful theological idea. In the Old Testament, they did not have an understanding of that. In the Old Testament, you, they didn't have a clear understanding of the first coming and second coming. It was just the coming of Christ. It is the incarnation that separated that into identity. And much more than just talking about the first and coming, second coming of Christ. It is talking about something so much greater in the incarnation of Christ than your little heart could imagine. The book of John introduces Jesus Christ by the current prophet to Israel, John the Baptist. The book of John opens up with identity of God and then puts John the Baptist in the forefront. He puts John the Baptist in the forefront. John, as he, as he baptized and identified Jesus Christ as the Messianic Savior, John said, Behold the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. Grasp that. The eternal Son of God steps out of Eternity into time in that little box on your paper and that point. Become the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, which is Adam's sin, by the way, Romans 5.12. It's not, not just your sin. It's the sin that you have in Adam. In Adam all die, 1 Corinthians 15.22. In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. You know what's interesting? When you look at Christ in the second coming and you read Revelation 19, 13, you see the rider of the white horse. You know what he's called? You know what he's called in the second coming? 
the rider on the white horse? He's called the Word of God. Isn't that interesting? He's called that in the first advent, and he's called that in the second advent because that's his identity. He calls him the Word of God. The Word of God. Next time you read that in, in soteriology, or, or in eschatology, when you read that the next time in eschatology, pay attention to it, the name of the rider on the white horse. Maybe it will jog your memory to this lesson. The messianic savior of the world came to the nation of Israel. I mean, planet Earth's pretty big. Sent to this little tiny nation who, by the way, was looking for him to come. And when he came, he rejected him. John 1, 11 through 13. He came to his own. His own received him not. But to as many as you and I who do receive him, they become sons of God. Aren't we proud? What does that mean? What does it mean to be a son of God? It means to be identified with eternal life. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have eternal life. The fact that that Son dropped in out of eternity to bring you eternity, the moment you believe Christ, you get eternal life because you're a Son of God. You too have eternal life like the Son of God had eternal life. You too in the Son of God have eternal life. A way to say to you, we're identified with eternity. With the plan of God, we're identified with God, the God of eternal, the eternal God. Simeon, when he holds the baby Jesus in the temple, declared a light of revelation, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory to thy people Israel. Luke 2.32. You know what he's quoting? Isaiah 42.6. It should be 6, not 16, 42, 6, and 49, 6. That the Messiah would be a light to the Gentiles as well as to the Jew. Jesus said it different, though, didn't he? When Jesus declared his light, he declared it differently. In John, the 8th chapter, according to John, in John, the 8th chapter, verse 12, he said, I am the light. To the world. Jesus Christ was be to the light, was to be the light to the Gentiles. From the Jew, the message of Christ was to go to the Gentile. They refused. Not only would they not take the message, but they killed all the messengers and the Son Himself. And so God turned to the Gentile nations as He predicted in prophetic prophecy about the Christ. Paul talks about it in Acts 13, 46, 47. It was necessary that the word of God was spoken to you first. Since you repudiated it and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles. See the prophecy fulfillment? That you may bring salvations to the end of the earth. Who would have ever guessed that this little small church here, setting in no place America, would be sending the message out across the world through the internet and sending missionaries to local areas with the eternal word of God. And not only that, but our people are taking the message to the highway and the, and the hedges of our cities. It's an amazing thing. 
I mean, I pinch myself every day to think where God has brought me from where I was. And what a miraculous change in my life has occurred in the beginnings of my life. I sat down one day and I thought, I might write a book on this. And so I started writing down. Listen, I've had so many beginnings with God in my life. I was overwhelmed in writing them down, beginning with my conversion in Tarrant City in 61. In 1961, I started writing them down. I wish I'd have had the good sense to write them when I had there. I'd have filled up books. I was overwhelmed. I, I was overwhelmed. And I would write one down, and then I would think, oh, from that one came five more. And I was overwhelmed with the beginnings. Here's a second idea this morning. The word of God became, becoming flesh was a sign, watch this, a sign to the temple shepherds of Bethlehem. They were temple, tempered shepherds, temple shepherds of Bethlehem. Now, everybody, if you're like my family, we read Luke, the second chapter, 8 through 20, and that's the story because all little kids like the angels and the shepherds and the sheep and, and uh, you know, a barn. <laughs> uh, so it's a great story, and of course it is. But when the angel said to them, these Jewish temple shepherds of Bethlehem, he talked in theological terms. They said, I want you, I'm going to give you a sign. Listen to what he said. He said, this will be a sign for you, the Bethlehem temple shepherds. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes lying in a manger. A sign. You want a great Christmas story? Study all the signs connected with the birth of Christ in Matthew and Luke. You will once again be overwhelmed. In 1 Corinthians 1.22, it says signs, biblical signs are for the Jews and biblical wisdom is for the Gentile. So it doesn't surprise you that there are a lot of signs, the magi come into town, the shepherds. I found it really interesting because there's a lot of information dropped on these temple shepherds. When you read what God, how he announced the Lamb of God to the shepherds, how he introduced the good shepherd to the shepherds is a pretty amazing story. Signs, I, and I noticed on my paper today, the word signs wasn't completely written. So if you find an IGN there, you need to put an S on it. Signs were an important part of communication under shadow Christology of the Old Covenant to Israel. You can read about this in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. It goes on in the story of Luke, the second chapter, verse 17. It says, and when they had seen this, you know what they saw? The sign. Now, what was the sign? You go find a baby, uh, go find a newborn baby lying in a manger. The kind of like a hide-and-go-seek kind of a scavenger hunt. Not too hard because you're looking, shepherds are looking in the shepherd barns. And when you get to the barns, look for a newborn baby lying in a manger. They hunted until they found the baby lying in a manger. And they saw the reality of the sign. A sign without biblical reality is not a true sign.
And when they had seen this, they made known the statement. See that word statement? That's, that's an interesting word. It's rima. Rima means a categorical idea. Uh, we call it categorical doctrine. Rima. It's not logos. It's rima. It's a specific category of the word of God. We call it categorical doctrine. And when they had seen this, the baby lying in a manger, which was going to be Christ, the Savior of the world. Joy to the world. That, that was the song that the shepherds got. Joy to the world was given to the shepherds. Come on now. And when they had seen this, they made known the categorical doctrine which had been told them about the child. That's 8 through 20. Read, not now, but read Luke 2, 8 through 20. It's a lot of theology in there. What they saw in Christ, they understood biblically and began to tell the story of the birth of Christ theologically. They began to tell the story as it had been told them theologically, categorically doctrine, point one, point two. When you read Luke 8 through 20, you'll see point one, point two, point three, point four, point five. See, sometimes we miss all this because we think we know what we're reading. We haven't listened to the Spirit of God teach us anything. Just because you read the Bible don't mean you know it. You don't know it until the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to you about it. John 14, 26, he will teach and recall truth. John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. From what? From crazy thinking. Theologically. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. This is Luke 2, 10. Behold, very important, pay attention, big news, neon sign. I bring you good news. See that word? That's the word evangelism. That Greek word on your paper is the English word evangelism or the gospel. The good news is the gospel. It is evangelizing. They took the message they had given them and began to evangelize the gospel of Jesus Christ at Bethlehem. They went local. Now, if I could get you to do that, we'd be in business. They went local with evangelism. They started in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That's our own responsibility. This Christmas, make sure that everybody that comes and puts their feet under your table are saved or at least have heard the message from you about the birth story that he's a savior come to the world. What a great opportunity we have this year. Listen, for behold, I bring you good news, gospel, present active indicative, of great joy. Not just joy. What kind of joy? Great, mega, mega joy. Mega, great means mega. Great joy, which will be for some people. Is that what your Bible says? No, sir, you ought to circle the word all people. Nobody will be left out unless they shut down volition. Listen, let me ask you this question this Christmas. Do you have great joy? Listen, but is it in things? Is it in tangible things that you could lose? You say, well, I have great joy. I just got married. Hmm. That's not the joy I'm talking about. Oh, I just have great joy because I got a new, I got a promotion. I'm not talking about it. You can lose it tomorrow. Oh, I have great joy because I just, we just bought a new house. Mm, you could lose it tomorrow. A big wind could come through and pff, that's gone. No, 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 no. Great joy is what you can never lose in time and eternity. This is a joy that surpasses all understanding. This is not temporal. This is permanent. This is a joy that once you have it, it, sits, it sets inside your memory center and it brings joy whenever you remember it. 
Whenever you recall that godly experience in your life, it brings joy. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about great joy. I'm talking about joy everlasting. You need to let God build in your Christian life memories of great joy so that in those times when you just get all caught up in the temporal things of life and you've lost your joy, you can look back on something of a beginning in your life where you had great joy because God, God, no doubt about it, God stepped into my life and changed it and did great things for me. And that great joy, once again through the Holy Spirit, that great joy will flood your soul and will lift you above the muck and mire of your life. Did you know that? Uh, yeah, you've, if you've set your feet in this church for a year, you know it. But do you believe it? Do you believe it? My final point. Now pay attention. One of six signs. One of six signs of spiritual maturity. This is what you have to look inside now. This is not a sign outside. Well, go look for a baby in a manger. Uh-uh. These are six signs inside you. This is, this is the signs I'm talking about enlightenment of Ephesians 1.18. You know, it's interesting to me. I gave you one of the most powerful verses you could ever have, and you never wrote it down. That's interesting to me. Now, you could be a visitor and don't understand the importance of what I'm teaching. That's, that's possible. But some of you that have been here a year with me, you know better. I didn't pop that out there just for no reason. There are six signs. You're not going to find them outside you. You're going to find them inside you, inside you spiritually. These are six signs, spiritual signs, that you can only find inside you. This is not a stop sign. This is not a stop light. These are inner workings of your spiritual life inside you. Listen to what Paul said. In 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verse 7, open your Bibles and put your eyes on it. He uses, he begins with the word abound. Abound which is a very interesting word, abound. Eighth chapter, verse 7. Just as you abound in everything, just as you exceed, like great joy, this word abound, this is John 10.10, 10. this is the abundant life. If you got joy, have great joy. If you have love, have great love. If you have peace, have great peace. Abound. There's no limit. Listen, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, and 23, when you add your growth of doctrine to it, it, the joy becomes great joy. The love becomes great love. Peace becomes great peace. Abound in everything. Abound in everything. John 10, 10. Abound in everything. Now watch what he does. He lists six. Watch this now. Look at the word in everything, and then he explains everything. He gives you six ideas about it in everything. You go like, well, Paul, in everything? He went, well, wait. <laughs> Let me give you six ideas to get you started. Let me give you six beginnings in everything. Let me give you beginnings. He uses the word in in plus the locative, in, in the Greek language. Watch he say? In faith, in utterance, in knowledge, 
in all earnestness, in love, and in grace. See the six? Yeah. See the second one? Utterance. That's logos. That's logos. That's logos. Utterance. By this word, the second one listed by Paul, utterance, is the word logos. Logos means utterance of speech. It means communication. And for the temple shepherds, it was the utterance of the good news. They were evangelizing. They were speaking the doctrinal truth. They were speaking the word of truth. They were evangelizing. That's the gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe it, you get saved. When you don't believe it, you remain unsaved. No matter if you go to church or don't go to church. This is what the temple shepherds did the first Christmas in Bethlehem. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement, the categorical doctrine, which was the gospel. Listen, you're going to, I don't want you to miss this idea. Listen to me. You want to build a legacy that will last years beyond your life? Well, let me give you one. Reach spiritual maturity, maintain it to die in grace, and you'll get it like Abel. Here's his legacy, historical legacy. Listen to what he says. People miss this stuff, you know. Here's Hebrews 11:4. By faith, Abel, you know, Cain and Abel. Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Now watch through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith cycling, faith cycling, though he is dead, he still speaks. That's the word utterance. A legacy of of the word of God attached to your life and your name and your experiences of beginnings that outlive you. Let me give you an example. I don't know how many little booklets called New Life Promises that Chuck Farmer wrote that we don't give out. We give out thousands of those a year. Chuck Farmer wrote this years before he died. We still hand them out. We still give them. They're so well done. That though he's dead, he still speaks. Right? We give tons of these away. And rightly so. Because the way he nailed the idea of what it means to be saved is marvelous in that little pamphlet. Your historical legacy is an important part of your life. One that you may have not thought about, but it's possible because the word of God that came through Jesus Christ has become flesh with your name tag on it. And it bears all of these kinds of fruit in your life. And one is your legacy. A historical legacy, Bob Thiem used to call it historical impact. The temple shepherd spoke about the good shepherd that would lay down his life for the sheep. When Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Did the temple shepherds understand this? Sure they did. 
David said, on behalf of this temple sheep, I fought bears and lions and put my life at risk. Remember that? Come on now. You studied David fighting the bear and the lion and then Goliath. Who was he? He was a shepherd of the temple sheep. These are the ancestors of that in Bethlehem. In the house of David. We are now the carriers of that message. We are the good sheep because we have a good shepherd. And our job is to carry the message. To carry the good word. To carry the good word. 1 Peter 2.25 reminds us, if you have strayed away from where you should be, come home. For you were continually straying like sheep. But now, through spiritual awakening, you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your soul. I don't know where you are today, but I know where you ought to be. I know where you ought to be. And, not, and that's not out in the toolies. Your life, I don't care if you're 14 or 15 or 16 or 25 or 85 or 105. I don't care where you are. Your job is not done. Your ministry is, your ministry, the, better, the best days of your ministry are ahead of you. They're not. They're, they're ahead of you. They're ahead of you. They're ahead of all of us. Listen. Your spiritual awakening in your soul will bring you to returning to the, listen, to the shepherd and the guardian of your soul, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Come home for Christmas. Come home for Christmas because the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us for a good reason. And that wasn't so we could put a Christmas tree up and put gifts underneath it. That we could carry the Christmas tree that became a cross. You know, wood is wood. It's what you do with it that makes it art. For me, the Christmas tree is the cross. It was what they saw when they went to the wooden manger scene. They saw the Savior of the world. They didn't see just a manger and a baby. They remembered the words that were connected to him, given to them. And they went and preached the gospel. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word becoming flesh. What an enormous period of time we live since the incarnation of Christ. We live in the anticipation of the second coming of Christ. When we talk about the first coming, we look backwards. May we strive, Father to carry the gospel, not just to the ends of the earth, but to the end of the street, in our neighborhoods, to the end in our family. Who didn't want to come to our Christmas gathering as a family, and why didn't they want to come? And should I not take Christmas to them? Well, if he don't want to come, so be it. Mm-mm. Uh-uh. No, no. We look for the strange sheep. He died for all. Encourage our hearts, Father. Because this is a new beginning. It's a new beginning for us as church. It's a new beginning in our, in our spiritual experiences as, a, as Christians. We are in a new beginning. A beginning, a beginning, a beginning. What an exciting time, Father, and I pray that we would understand the theology behind the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten son of the Father. 
And so we are too, Father, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.